So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Adam Beale, who will be giving us our talk today. Adam is um, on part of our Earth Sciences and end of Earth and Environmental Science. Uh, he's a postdoctorate researcher who uses computational models to understand the Earth. Um, so I'll pass it over to Adam now, if you can share your screen and your audio. Great, thank you for that, Jess. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, that looks great. I will uh, turn off my, my video and my audio now. Um, look forward to the talk. Okay, and I'll, I'll just check out, um, you can see my mouse as well? Yes. Excellent. All right, thank you very much for that introduction, Jazz. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, well, firstly, does the Earth behave like a giant lava lamp? That seems like a bit of a kind of um, bizarre question, given that a lava lamp is something that sits on your desk um, and the Earth is this huge thing. Um, and obviously kind of the Earth moves very slowly while the lava lamp um, kind of moves very quickly. Um, so I'll show you how they're actually kind of quite similar um, and how we can use one to understand the other. And, um, and in doing so, I'd like to try and answer this question. Um, how can we use lava lamps? And by that, I mean convection, some models of convection. How can we use those to explain why we have plate tectonics on Earth? So firstly, I'll just introduce plate tectonics. Uh, I'm sure you've probably heard about it before, but just as a, um, a bit of a kind of recap. Um, so what we mean is um, uh, th there's this discovery that if you look at um, where kind of large earthquakes happen on the Earth, um, they tend to happen um, in very kind of localized areas. So it's say here in the middle of the oceans, you can see um, these regions of, of earthquakes and then um, at the edges of some continents. So it's here kind of beside New Zealand, uh, beside South America and so on. Um, and because earthquakes give you an idea of where the earth is deforming um, close to the surface, what this really means is that the earth only really deforms a lot in these discrete bands. Um, and we call those the plate edges. So the idea is that the, um, we have what are called plates where um, the middle of the plate, say um, in which Australia is sitting in, doesn't deform very much. Um, and it's only really at the edges. Um, and it's also at the edges where you have these earthquakes. You not only do you have large earthquakes, but you also tend to have um, large, you often have mountains um, and other kind of geological activity happening. So not only um, does plate tectonics tell you about where deformation happens, uh, but also tells you how the surface of the Earth moves. Um, so on the right-hand side here, um, we have a plot of the age of the ocean floor. Um, so um, you'll see that in the middle of the oceans, um, the ocean floor is relatively young, and at the edges, it's relatively old. Uh, and, and why is that? Uh, one explanation is that um, the ocean um, floor it forms in the middle of the oceans, where it's very young, and then it, it, um, it, it moves horizontally across the surface of the Earth. So, so what you're essentially seeing is the movement of the oceans um, as these plates move. Um, and um, so you, you have ocean floor um, forming uh, in the middle of the oceans, moving horizontally. And then you'll see there are earthquakes. Um, they're colored by a depth here. You have deep earthquakes um, in some areas near continents. So that's where the ocean floor is sinking back down again. So the, the side is process is called plate tectonics. So what I'm trying to uh, answer today is why does the Earth have plate tectonics? Um, it, it's actually not, not that obvious that, that, that it should, uh, but it obviously does. Uh, and why is that interesting? Well, um, because of plate tectonics, we have earthquakes, um, which are obviously very impactful um, for, for people in different regions. Um, plate tectonics also explains why we have mountains, why we have volcanoes in certain areas. Uh, and it's very much the cornerstone of, of, of how we understand the geology of the Earth. Um, by contrast, Venus, which is the, uh, the next kind of planet most similar to Earth, it doesn't have any plate tectonics. So the surface, surface, surface of Venus is mainly dictated by kind of impact craters and, and volcanism. So it's very, very different. So it's kind of interesting to ask, well, well why does Earth have plate tectonics? And we're going to do, answer that by kind of thinking about convection um, as per the lava lamp model. 
So, so in this talk, I'm kind of um, basically saying that we can use mantle con convection, the idea of convection, which is what the, uh, the process that the lava lamp represents. We're using convection as a model for plate tectonics. Um, so it's kind of important to, to kind of state this clearly because they're not the, the same thing, even though that they look um, the same. So convection is very general process that could, um, that, that, that um, represents all kinds of things. So for example, um, it might represent um, movement in the lava lamp. It might represent movement in our atmosphere. Um, I'll explain a little bit more of that later on, uh, but it, it's very, very generic. Um, but it, it describes this movement of, of the fluid um, in terms of the forces that drive it. Um, so that's why we call it a dynamic theory because we can think about the forces and the dynamics of it and make predictions about, um, about how the flows will move and so on. Whereas plate tectonics, uh, it describes how the surface of the earth moves, but it doesn't really describe much more than that. So it's what we call a kinematic theory in that we, it can tell you how something is moving, but it won't tell you how it will move in the future or what's driving it. Um, so as we'll see, um, plate tectonics actually looks a lot like um, convection. Um, so that's why we think that mantle convection is what drives tectonics. So now I'll introduce the idea of, of, of convection. Um, so you're probably kind of vaguely familiar with what convection is. Um, the idea is that, um, so we'll start with the lava lamp. Um, so the idea is that at the base of the lava lamp, you have a, um, a lamp, um, which is the heat source. So that heats up the bottom of the fluid. Uh, and what happens is the fluid that, that's in the lava lamp, when it heats up, it actually expands and its density decreases. So it becomes less dense. Um, this fluid here becomes less dense than the fluid around it. And as a result of that, it rises. Uh, by the same token, um, when, it, when it kind of gets to the top here, it cools down. And as it cools down, it, it, um, it contracts and becomes more dense. And as a result of that, it will sink. So you're probably familiar with this. Um, for example, when you, um, when you put a pot of water onto the stove, you have a heat source at the bottom that heats up the water uh, and the, that water will actually kind of move as a result. Or um, I guess more topical, as if we're getting colder now, uh, everyone's turning on the heaters, you, you can do a little experiment and find that if you put your hand over, over the top of your heater, um, you'll find that the air is warmer there because the air is warming uh, on the heater and rising up. Um, so this is, this is the process of, process of convection. And so the lava lamp is what we call an analog model, um, where it shows you the convection process in a very generic way, and you can use that as an analog for other things. Uh, and then we have um, what's called a numerical model, where we use mathematics to, um, to solve particular kind of fluid flow equations and reproduce convection as well. So that's mainly what I do, but in very it, it, um, they're very much kind of related in that we're, we, we're treating that as a model, so not exactly the same thing, but a representation that's very simple that tells us something about the process. And we're going to be talking about mantle convection. So, so what, what is the mantle? It's this outer 2,900 kilometers of the earth. So a huge, huge area. Um, and for, for our um, purposes, you can think of it as being um, very hot and, um, and relatively weak. So it's still solid. Um, so it's certainly not a liquid. Um, but over a very long time period, so kind of millions of years, it, it, uh, it slowly, what we call creeps, so it deforms very slowly, and if you were to speed, speed that up, it would look like it was deforming like a fluid, just like the lava lamp, for example. And then we have the outer layer of the Earth here, um, which is what we call the lithosphere, um, which, because the surface of the Earth is obviously cool, um, that cools down and becomes dense and, and sinks down in, in, in the same way that these kind of blobs in the lava lamp sink. Um, so the idea is that, um, that, that this process of convection looks a lot like um, what we're seeing in the lava lamp or in a simple numerical model. I'll point out that one difference is with the lava lamp um, and, and this numerical model, um, the heat source is at the bottom of the lamp um, and so that's where the fluid gets heated up. A slight difference with the earth is um, within the mantle we have um, radiogenic elements which decay, so thormium, potassium um, and uranium. And as those decay, they form, they, they produce heat. So we have, um, so there is some residual heat of the earth and heat that comes up from the base, but there's also heat that comes um, from, from the middle of the mantle as well. But the actual process of convection is essentially the same. So 
we're essentially saying that plate tectonics is, it looks a lot like mantle convection. So I'll give you some more examples of that. So we can use what's called seismic tomography to look at uh, the density of rock in the earth. So because um, when earthquakes um, occur, they send vibrations through the earth and those vibrations travel at different speeds depending on the density of the earth. If you, me if you measure an earthquake from lots of different locations, you can make up a, a model of what the density looks like. And because we know colder rock is denser, uh, when we're looking at these dense blue anomalies, um, they, they, um, they're essentially cold. So for example, if we look at this cross section through, um, let's say Indonesia here, where we know that the ocean floor is moving northwards, um, we have this, this cold, dense material that's sinking through the earth. So you can think of that as being the, um, the kind of blob from the lava lamp that's sinking down. Um, it's what we call a subducting slab. Um, what, you do, what you also find is that um, if, you did, if you did the same exercise for the middle of the oceans, where we know that the plates are separating, um, you don't see a kind of upwelling in the same way that you would for a, a lava lamp. So we don't see hot material rising from the very base of um, the mantle. So, so the, um, because of that, um, the style of convection that the earth follows is more what we'd call kind of top-down convection. So here we still have the cold downwelling, but we don't have as much as of the upwelling. And that's because of, uh, as I said earlier, um, the mantle is heated from within. Um, so, so because of that, it's very much more about the kind of the, the top of the lava lamp rather than the bottom. Um, you could say. So now we'll kind of get on to using um, the, the, mantle, the convection model to ask the question, does the earth convect? Um, and so what we, what we can ask is, is it reasonable that the earth convects? Um, so for example, um, if we kind of um, get a model of, of convection, uh, Say, say, for example, these models on the right-hand side here, um, we can kind of understand what drives convection and we can, we can ask the question, is it reasonable to, th to think that these apply to the earth? Um, so, so what we do um, with in fluid dynamics is we try and characterize um, fluid flow by these kind of key numbers um, that kind of represent, they tell us something special about the dynamics of the fluids. So for convection, one of the key numbers is the Rayleigh number. So this number, it doesn't have any units, and it applies, which means that it applies to the lava lamp just as easily as it does to the earth. So the Rayleigh number in this case is very big. So we have a um, convection of the Rayleigh number 10 to the five, which means one with five zeros uh, after it. So it's quite a large number. And then we have a large Rayleigh number for, um, convection um, cell here of 10 to, the, 10 to the power of um, seven. So you'll see with the higher Rayleigh number, um, the, the kind of cold blue layer gets thinner. Um, and I don't have a video to show you, but the convection becomes more vigorous. So it happens more quickly uh, and more kind of chaotically. Uh, if you go the other way, if you turn the railing number down low, um, when you get to about one, uh, heat actually diffuses more um, at a similar rate as to which um, the fluid is deforming. Um, so in that case, convection will, will, will not happen. So what we can ask is, what is the railing number of the earth? Uh, if it's much bigger than one, then it's reasonable that, um, that the Earth convex. So I don't want to kind of scare you, but uh, here's more or less a kind of simple definition of what the Rayleigh number is in terms of uh, the kind of physical quantities that, that go into it. Um, so we can kind of think about what, which, what each of these is for the Earth. Um, and and um, so the, the numbers on the top will mean that the larger those things are, the more likely convection is to happen. The bottom, the viscosity and thermal diffusivity, uh, diffusivity, the larger those are, the less likely convection is going to happen. So we can go through and look at the numbers. So the density contrast, if you compare the coldest material to the hottest, um, to the kind of typical uh, rocks and typical temperatures on Earth, that, that comes out as being 100 kilograms per cubic metre. Um, so that, that sounds like a large number, but actually the density of rock is about 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter. The density of water is about 1,000. So we're talking about quite a small proportion um, of density change that, that would have to drive convection. Um, and gravity, it's, it's always more or less um, 
um, 10, uh, on Earth at least, and then um, the thickness of the mantle, so as we said before, is 2,900 kilometres, so that's quite a large number. Um, so the viscosity, so that is the strength of the fluid. Um, so it kind of, the higher the viscosity is, uh, the higher the forces have to be to drive that fluid deformation. Um, and that tends, tends out to be quite large um, for the, this kind of hot middle bit of the Earth. Um, and then we have the thermal um, diffusivity, which is 10 to the power of negative six, quite small. Um, so if you, if you um, do this, if you kind of um, check out this equation, you get 10 to the power of six, so very, very high, mostly as a result of the Earth being so large. So it's sort of the th thickness of the mantle is so large that you get a very large number. So it is reasonable then that um, kind of if you apply um, the kind of what we know about mantle convection, um, it's reasonable to, sorry, if you, if, we know, if you apply what we understand about convection, then it's, um, it's reasonable to, to think that the Earth could convect. The only issue is, um, if you look at the viscosity closer to the surface of the Earth, it can become much, much larger. So the, the kind of cold bit that we, that we kind of live quite close to is, is much larger than this 10 to the power of um, 22. So if you were to instead use this number, you'd find that convection wouldn't, wouldn't actually happen in the same way. And you'd have what, what we call stagnant lid convection. So in this case, because the surface of the earth is so strong, it doesn't actually participate in convection, it just sits there. Um, and this is quite a bad model for plate tectonics because the surface doesn't move at all. And that's actually probably more like what's happening on, on Venus um, than on Earth. So the question is then, what do we do about this strong outer layer? Um, how, how is it the Earth convex when, uh, when the outer layer is, is meant to be so strong? So we can kind of do this exercise where we think about um, the stresses that are driving convection. Um, so here we have another convection model. Um, here we have these cold downwellings. Um, and, and this is a, in this, in this um, picture, we have stagnant lid convection happening. We can think about um, what has to happen for this to switch to the kind of convection um, that we're expecting on, on Earth. Um, so if you consider that, um, that there's some kind of um, strength uh, of, of the material near the surface of the Earth, um, say that might be a kind of a brittle strength, um, so a, a kind of a, a strength at which when the forces get large enough, you have lots of brittle um, deformation, lots of um, um, like frictional deformation and so on. Uh, then you can, you can, we can model this and, and say, well, under, under particular situations, if these driving stresses get, these driving forces get high enough, you actually um, break, break this, um, this stagnant lid and, and you get convection again. So, so we kind of, we know that there has, something has to happen to make the outer layer weak enough for this to happen. Um, so, so something has to be weakening um, the outer lithosphere of the Earth uh, in order to produce the kind of convection that we're expecting. Uh, so, so this is another kind of zoom. So I'm kind of zooming in now. If we um, look at an area kind of about this big, uh, we're now looking at the strength uh, of the of the fluid, so the viscosity. Um, and again, we have these downwellings here. We have an upwelling here, and um, and and in this situation, the strength goes down. I mean, areas where the forces are very high. So you can see where there's an upwelling, the forces are high and we're weakening the, um, the, the material, the, the lithosphere, and also where there's a downwelling, the, strength, the forces are very high and we're weakening. So we can, we can expect that, um, that there might be situations in which these downwellings and upwellings, they, 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 um, if they get to a kind of critical um, foot like stress level, they can then weaken um, the outer layer. Uh, if you look at the numbers, it has to weaken it a great deal. Um, so, so we're, more, we're kind of talking about this um, this interface here. Uh, this is what how we, we, we think um, um, seduction happens on Earth. We, we think that instead of weakening everything, you produce this weak um, interface that allows the dense material, uh, the downwelling, to to, um, to occur. We find that we need a uh, a strength that's very very low, so much lower than, than what you just typically think for friction. Um, so something, so, so, so we, we know that the material here, here is, is often weak, but it has to be, it turns out it has to be very weak in order to, in the, in the, in the numerical models, in order to produce, um, 
um, convection with the, with the lithosphere um, forming downwellings. So, so you can kind of do this by having very high pore pressure. Um, so if you have water in the pores of, of the rock uh, that's under very high pressure, that can weaken it. Uh, also, um, people from, uh, from, from Cardiff University uh, who I work with have been um, going and looking at the rocks that we find at the um, interface here and find that there actually are quite, quite a lot of weak uh, minerals. So th these grey minerals here um, have lots of what we call polysilicates um, that are very, very weak. Um, and if you go deeper in the earth as well, um, down to say here, uh, we also find that uh, even kind of mantle rocks have processes where the, um, the grains can get very, very fine and because of that, very, very weak. And we can make models of this to look at how, um, what the strength of the materials should be if you have kind of mixtures of this weak material uh, in amongst stronger. Uh, and it does seem reasonable that um, once you have the interface there, it could be um, weak enough to have uh, plate tectonics um, occurring. So the question then is, well, how do you make a new plate? So it's fair enough that convection happens uh, and, and, and kind of plate, plate tectonics happen if you make these weak zones, but it's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, situation in terms of, well, how do you actually make them to start with? And that's something that we're just still not, not that sure about. Um, but we, you, we can do it kind of virtually in, in numerical models in the same way that I was describing earlier, where we know that these kind of downwellings and upwellings produce, can produce high stresses um, and high forces. So if, if they get to some critical stress level, they might form a new plate boundary. Uh, so this is um, uh, some work uh, by Claire Mallard, who has, um, has basically reproduced this. Um, so, so in this model, these, these um, downwellings form spontaneously in areas where the stresses get high enough. Uh, and you can imagine this is a very complicated system um, because you know um, downwell into one area might produce downwell into another area and so on. But it, and if you but if you do this, um, if you do assume that they can, can spontaneously form in areas where the force is very high, um, they find actually you, you can reproduce plates that look very similar, um, have different similar sizes and so on to the Earth. Um, so it's kind of a reasonable hypothesis to um, to to consider um, that, that they can kind of spontaneously form. And then when they do form, they look like um, this. Um, so in summary, plate tectonics um, is possible um, because if we think about the lava lamp model and, and, and how convection occurs, it is reasonable to think that the earth can convect, but only if you can form these very, very weak zones near the surface. So, if this didn't happen, um, if we couldn't form these weak zones, we wouldn't have any mountains, we wouldn't have uh, any kind of topography, so no ocean basins and so on, no um, earthquakes, um, whether it be better or not, um, that's kind of questionable, but anyway, the, 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 the planet would be very, very different. It would look something more like Venus potentially. Um, so I'll end the talk there and be very happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you so much for that, Adam. Really interesting. I can't believe how literally similar to a lava lamp it is. I know it was in the title, but yeah, that's very cool. Okay, we have some questions coming in. Um, while I wait to see if there are any more, uh, I'll just ask you my question, which is, so models require you to put in data to sort of uh, predict or um, look at different outcomes for things. Where does that data come from? Is it sort of the geological record? Is it when plates move in real time? What kind of data do you put in, feed into those models? So there are actually lots of different approaches. Um, so, so some people in the past have taken a very data-driven um, approach of saying, um, let's impose, say, the surface velocities. So because we, we know those very well, you can say, um, set, for, for example, um, in this kind of model, set what the surface velocity is and watch the convection kind of be driven by that. Uh, whereas in, when I can actually find this kind of model um, and a lot of the ones I was, shown, uh, I was showing, they actually, um, they don't really have many kind of data inputs in them. We're really just um, assuming something like what the Rayleigh number is, um, which we have mm -hmm. a, kind of a pretty good idea of. And then we're, um, we're just looking at the dynamics. The only issue with that is, uh, when you do that, they don't often always match their observations. 
So the, the convection might look correct, but the plate velocity might be off a little bit. So there's, there's a kind of middle ground between having lots of data, not very much data, and kind of meeting in the middle to understand the physics. Mm. Thank you. So our first question is from Beth. How was the cold and hard to break lithosphere theory modelled and discovered? Uh, so, so I guess this kind of um, model, I'm not 100% I'm not sure about the history of it, um, but the way that I'm most familiar with is, is actually um, when people have tried to model plate tectonics. So in a way that I'm kind of been describing and had trouble doing so. Um, so people said, well, we know that that there are these huge strength contrasts, what happens if we consider those? And then found that, that, to, that, that the convection just didn't happen, um, that they instead had this statement lead to convection. Um, so, so from that perspective, I think that came out of the, the, this kind of numerical modeling uh, following very kind of similar kind of steps that I've just described. I'm not sure whether there must have been at some stage, people have always asked, also asked why you don't have tectonics on other planets, because um, there, there are kind of ways that you can tell whether or not uh, a planet has tectonics and Earth is the only one that does. So I think that was very much the angle as well of trying to think about, well, um, what, what would the alternatives be? Um, and this is one that the, um, the kind of the, the physics of convection kind of naturally um, tells you could be an option. Great, thank you. Got another question. Um, how theoretical is this model? This is from Josh. I know we've only bored uh, 7.5k into the mantle. I didn't know that. As a result of this, what's the main method of data collection we have? Is it imaging? So okay, how, uh, how, how do the data, how do you get the data from the model? How theory based is it versus based on ba data, given that we can't just look straight into the earth? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's true. We haven't seen the rocks down here in the mantle. Um, but, um, so what we can do, I mean, there, there are lots of different ways. In, in my opinion, the most convincing um, is this kind of, using seismic tomography, you can look at the density um, of the earth and, and, and the temperature. Um, and so, so because of that, uh, you can, because we can get the density, um, we can also then get the, the forces because we know the density drives, the density contrast drives, um, convection, uh, the, 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 where the forces come from, um, you can get those directly. Uh, and what you can actually do is um, you can get this temperature and you can put it into a model. So, so you kind of say, say get this temperature profile, ex export it into, it into a model and see, whether, see what velocities you get um, and s see how the convection evolves. And when, when people do that, they can actually very closely re reduce the velocities on the surface of the earth, which says that, um, that our theoretical model does a really good job of comparing, say, the temperature in the Earth um, to what we see on the surface. Great, thank you. I'll just give another minute to see if anyone else has a question. If anyone joined us later, just click on the Q&A box on your screen um, and send it through. Uh, in the meantime, while I wait to see if there's a final question, um, what's your favourite thing about being an academic and your least favourite thing? Uh, well, so I guess my favourite thing is, is kind of getting to explore um, scientific questions, really. Um, so it's so kind of trying to kind of be at the forefront of, of knowledge and trying to learn new things. Uh, I think it's very exciting. Um, I, I guess my least favourite thing, uh, I guess it can be quite a high pressure. Mm. Not, not, not to use a kind of pun here, but it can be kind of a high pressure environment. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, it can become kind of very um, difficult to kind of, uh, kind of come up with lots of ideas and to, um, to publish papers about them very quickly and so on. Yeah. Okay, another question. Um, does the difference in tectonic activity between the Earth and other planets have anything to do with the elements that went into the formation of them? Uh, so, so yeah, uh, this is probably getting a little bit beyond my, my expertise, um, but uh, uh, 
so, so I, I don't think it's really that that clear, uh, really, as to why. If you, if you were to say compare Earth to Venus, uh, I, I don't think it's still that clear as to why Venus doesn't have tectonics. Um, so I, I think a lot of people would, would, would say it comes down more to these weak zones that I'm talking about. Um, so for whatever reason, um, you can't form weak plate edges. Um, so some people would say maybe that's related to uh, a lack of um, water. Um, so like water plays a big part on the Earth um, in terms of making weak minerals that we find in those plate um, edges. Um, so it, it might be more likely to be something like that. But who knows, maybe there is something uh, about the kind of chemical makeup of the planets as well that I'm not so familiar with. Mm. So there's just a follow-up question from Josh who asked about how theoretical the, the model is. Um, are there any concerns about parts of the mantle um, further down that could cause problems for humans in the future, i.e. anomalies, so natural disasters? Uh, he's aware that the Yellowstone caldera is a huge concern as a supervolcano, so are there any anything that's concerning about the mantle, maybe any gaps in our knowledge about it? Uh, well, well, I'd say like really kind of most of the kind of natural hazards all kind of occur very, very close, to, well, relatively close to the surface, the ones that affect us the most. So you can, for example, have earthquakes that occur down to say six or 700 kilometers or even deeper, but they don't really kind of affect us very much. It's really the earthquakes are happening very, very shallow. Um, mm. By the same token, um, some sometimes volcanoes are driven by upwellings. So I said these. I said that these upwellings don't, don't happen um, very much, but but they do happen in in some areas. So there's just a small number of them. So maybe some, sometimes those can be responsible for um for for um, for volcanoes. So for example, below Iceland, the idea is that there's a, a big kind of plume like kind of like this that produces that the. the um, brings a lot of heat to the surface that, that produces volcanism. Um, so that those would be the obvious things that I would suggest. Great, thank you so much. Oh, one last question, let's, let's fit it in. Is there any evidence of past tectonic activity on Mars? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about Mars. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not so, Familiar, familiar with Mars because I'm most of my own work I kind of focus on Earth. But um, but I'll say in terms of Venus, there is a bit of speculation that maybe there could have been um, previous um, tectonics on, on Venus um, because when 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 you run, run these uh, numerical models um, and look at kind of different kind of convection regimes, there are some in which you kind of switch between. Uh, where are we? There's some in which you kind of switch between these two modes where you have stagnant lead, then you form something that looks like tectonics and then you go back again. So it is possible to switch back and forth. So some people would say that, that um, potentially um, Venus did once have something that looked a little bit like tectonics, but it is quite difficult to say. Mm. I guess now that we're looking for life on both Mars and Venus, then, you know, it's interesting to draw the comparisons and differences. Great. Well, yeah, I think yeah. that's the end of the question. Thank you so much for answering such good questions. And thank you everyone at home who's been sending in your questions. Um, so I'll that's draw fine. this to a close then. Thank you very much to Dr. Adam Beale for your talk. And thank you very much um, to everyone who came along. Next week, we've got Mike Pryor-Jones, um, a very interesting colleague of mine, talking about the plumbing of glaciers. Um, so please do tune in and remember that previous talks are on our YouTube channel as well. So I think that that's it for now. I'll end the recording here. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm.